I would like to say that I don't know what Barlow and Bear were thinking leading up to all of this, but I truly believe that they thought that TikTokers would ride at dawn for them against Netflix. That's it. That's my intro. Hi, I'm Amanda. You're watching Small Entertainment. And today we are talking about the newest lawsuit that I am following. I always think that it's important when a content creation a sphere and someone who's interested in both writing and acting uh, to, you know, be aware of what's going on in the entertainment industry. We are talking about the Barlow and Bear lawsuit from Netflix. All of this is surrounding the unofficial Bridgerton musical. I was not familiar with Bear, but I was familiar with Barlow. Barlow is Abigail Barlow. And uh, I became familiar with her in uh, 2020, I believe, when she put out her song Heartbreak Hotel. I listened to it on repeat on Spotify. It was a fun song. So I started following her then. And then when Bridgerton came out and she started working on the Bridgerton musical, I was already following her. So I was following that whole process. So I've seen for the most part how this is all played out and how this has all come about and how it's gotten to this point. I also want to talk about my opinions on fan works because I've talked about it previously on this channel, but I haven't done it in a while, I don't think. The one that I feel I can mostly point to is in 2020, I did a video about the AO3 Pocket AO3, I believe. It was an app that a third party person was making. That video actually didn't do incredibly well. Um, it was at the very start of when my channel was taking off. And so uh, it was when my, my views were all over the place. But basically the gist of that is that AO3, Archive of Our Own, is a free site for uh, fan works and it's a whole archive, it's it's a whole thing. I could totally go into an explanation of Archive of Our Own, but I would butcher it. And it's just one of those things where you just kind of go look at it, have fun. It'll destroy your life. It has controlled mine. Um, <laughs> I, I'm pro fan works. I am pro fan fiction. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Problem with the pocket archive was that what it was, was it was a third party app. They took fix from AO3 and uploaded it to their site. The thing about fan works is that you can make fan fiction, you can make fan art, you can do X, Y, and Z, as long as you essentially don't try to profit from it. That's where the issue comes in. So fan fiction, totally legal. Profiting off of fan fiction, commission fan fiction, selling fan fiction as a physical copy, X, Y, and Z is the problem. A lot of fan fiction authors know that they cannot profit from their works that they do. And so they were concerned that their fanfics being put on a app that was involving a paywall that there could potentially be legal ramifications for them because their name is on the fan fiction, even though they are not seeing any form of profit from the app. And what ended up happening was that AO3 said, here's what you can do to get your stuff taken down because yes, you can in fact do a DMCA takedown, even though you don't own the original IP, you do in fact own the fan work. AO3 themselves actually ended up filing uh, infringement lawsuits against Pocket Archive because of using their colors, their logo, a bunch of other stuff. And I think Pocket Archives died a quick death. The issue here again, same thing. The fan work is not the problem. The unofficial Bridgerton musical is not the problem. Them getting a Grammy from it, yes, it won a Grammy, is not a problem. The problem is the selling tickets to a live show. So this is from a TechCrunch article, Netflix lawsuit against the Bridgerton musical could change online fandom. This is from Amanda Silberling. I'll have it linked down below like usual. Netflix filed a lawsuit this weekend against two TikTok stars in their early 20s. They're... I, I will say, what do their ages have to do with it? If I was sued tomorrow, would it matter that I'm 24? Like, would it? Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear alleging that their Grammy-winning unofficial Bridgerton musical project infringed on the copyright of Netflix original series Bridgerton. Bridgerton, for those of you that aren't aware, I have not done a video on Bridgerton. I've done a video on the Bridgerton experience. So the Bridgerton series on Netflix is based on the Bridgerton series of books written by Julia Quinn. Julia Quinn owns Bridgerton. Early last year, the songwriting duo started penning impressive ballads about the popular Netflix show for fun, posting them on TikTok. Their videos were so popular that Barlow and Bear released an entire musical soundtrack based on Bridgerton, then beat out legends like Andrew Lloyd Webber to win the 2022 Grammy Award for Best Musical Album. The moment was a milestone demonstrating the impact of social media on pop culture. On July 26, the duo staged a sold out performance at the Kennedy Center in New York, featuring the National Symphony Orchestra and a collection of Broadway guest stars with tickets ranging from $29 to 149 plus VIP upgrades, Netflix put its foot down after repeated objections, demanding an end to these for-profit performances. They linked the lawsuit, which I will have linked down below. Netflix Worldwide Entertainment LLC, Netflix Studios LLC, et cetera. 
uh, versus Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear. Defendants Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear and their companies, Barlow and Bear, have taken valuable intellectual property from the Netflix original series Bridgerton to build an international brand for themselves. Bridgerton reflects the creative works and hard-earned success of hundreds of artists and Netflix employees. Netflix owns the exclusive right to create Bridgerton songs, musicals, and any other derivative works based on Bridgerton. Barlow and Bear cannot take that right, made valuable by others' hard work, for themselves without permission. Yet this is exactly what they have done. The live show featured over a dozen songs that copied verbatim dialogue, character traits, and expression, and other elements from Bridgerton the series. It included dramatic portrayals of Bridgerton characters by Broadway actors, emoting through the performance of the songs that comprised the musical. Barlow and Bear misrepresented to the audience that they were using Netflix's Bridgerton trademark with permission, while Netflix vigorously objected. Barlow and Bear also announced they intend to stage yet another performance of their unauthorized derivative works at the Royal Albert Hall in London, making this a world tour. Barlow and Bear even promoted their own line of Bridgerton-themed merchandise. Barlow and Bear's conduct began on social media but stretches fan fiction well past its breaking point. It is blatant infringement of intellectual property rights. Talking about why. Mother f I'm going to turn you around. My friend made me that Mothman painting and I love it, but it takes trying to steal my limelight. And you can argue that, yes, putting things on Spotify, putting things on TikTok, all of that, there's profit in that, uh, including, I believe, was this before or after? Barlow got a commercial for Pantene or another hair care product and a few other things. She wrote a couple of music from that. I'm trying to remember if that was before or after the Bridgerton musical, because they could argue that some of those earnings were, some of those opportunities were gained from Bridgerton the musical. I don't think they are. But uh, they're talking about them making a brand for themselves off the back of Bridgerton. Netflix is struggling right now. They are hemorrhaging money. My guess is this lawsuit is partially because they are hemorrhaging money, but they're also Netflix. And again, I agree. There are plenty of people that have worked on Bridgerton that, you know, hardworking people made Bridgerton what it was, both Julia Quinn and the cast and crew, et cetera, of the show itself. Like this article goes on to say, they broke a lot of viewership records for streaming for Netflix. One of their most popular shows right now is Bridgerton is my point. So obviously they want to protect those IP rights. Arlo and Bear's lawyers first approached Netflix in March, 2021, asking for the streaming giant's blessing of a recorded album and a charity show. Netflix, according to its own characterization in its lawsuit, said that it wouldn't authorize the activity, but also wouldn't stand in the way. For Netflix, the Kennedy Center performance was a step too far. Bar. Barlow and Bear did not have permission from Netflix to stage their ticketed event, but according to legal experts, next Netflix's permission is irrelevant to the question of copyright infringement. They care about money only. That's what they care about, you know? They probably also think that the unofficial Bridgerton musical was not going to affect Bridgerton streaming numbers. And then there's also the uh, live Bridgerton ball experiences here in LA and in Washington, DC, which I went to the LA one. I have a video about that that'll be linked down below. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I was not the diamond. In the actual complaint itself, I believe that they're saying that the New York Kennedy Center performance also violated their, you know, physical Bridgerton experiences that they are, they are those, those Bridgerton experiences that I'm talking about, those are organized in part with Netflix. Those are official. You could argue potentially is someone going to go, huh, am I going to go to this? I think it was 60 bucks for me to go to the live person Bridgerton ball or, you know, 25 bucks to go see a live performance of an unofficial Bridgerton musical talking about the same characters, singing songs about plot elements. I can understand why they're concerned. The article goes on to ask, is the Bridgerton musical legal? It's complicated. Blatant infringement of intellectual property rights, but the legal reality isn't as cut and dry as Netflix complaint makes it out to be. Historically, fan works have sometimes been deemed legal under the fair use doctrine, which states that some copyrighted material can be used without explicit permission. I have seen a lot of people implying that because Barlow and Bear are com commercializing it, that means it's not fair use, Feisler told TechCrunch. And also Feisler is Casey Feisler, an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder who studies internet law and fandom. Wait, I'm writing her name down. I'm gonna look up your stuff. Do you have articles? Wanna come to my podcast? <laughs> I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Whether something is commercial or non-commercial is part of a fair use analysis, but it's part of only one factor. Fair use analysis looks like the purpose of a work. Is it for profit? The amount of copyright material in it uses the nature of the work, how transformative it is and how the work might economically impact the original. For example, uh, I guess, I don't know if this fits, but I mean, this was someone who was very concerned and messaged me about this. They were like, they can sue you for this. Um, I did my Morbius review 
Morbius sucked. I did not like it. And I made a video about it and I reviewed it. And I talked about a variety of things of why I didn't like it, how I would have fixed it, plot elements, all of it. I made a review, a lot of comments of people saying like, I was gonna go see this, but thank you. I don't wanna go see it now, you know, X, Y, and Z. I tweeted out, thanks for watching my video instead of watching Morbius. And someone messaged me and was very concerned, like they're gonna sue you. If that's true, if people are saying that they're gonna sue you. I'm like, I really don't think that Marvel is that concerned that Sony is worried about little me. I don't think that I am their issue. Here, these people want a fucking Grammy. The Grammy adds to, I would say validity to the unofficial Bridgerton musical. If I won, is there a video award? If I want to stream me specifically for my morbid, my Morbius review, I won't. <laughs> fun fact, um, have fun with the, all your it's Morbentine comments. Every time you guys do that, every time there's like a new wave of those on my video, this is the greatest movie of all time, it's Morbentine. The video gets another 10,000 views. I think it has to prove that there is like legitimate threat to the economic draw of the original. And I truly don't think my video did that. You could argue, that maybe no one who is going to go see the unofficial Bridgerton musical has not already watched Bridgerton or would choose that over Bridgerton. And I'm wondering if that's why Barlow, see, I just keep coming back to like, how did Barlow and Bear not think this through? Oh, no one's gonna choose this over them, so we should be fine. That maybe that was their belief. I can see that being their belief. I don't think it's a, a sound belief. I don't think it's safe to like assume that, you know, and think that that's gonna protect you, but still. Beisler told TechCrunch that there have been many examples of commercial fan works that were determined in court to be fair use, though there isn't as much case law and precedent since these disputes are often settled before they reach a judge. Oh, they talk about uh, 2015, a federal judge in New York ruled in favor of 3C, an off-Broadway play that offered a dark, more adult spin of the 70s television show, Three's Company. The judge wrote in a lengthy rule that the play was a highly transformative parody, so it didn't pose a market threat to the original show. Prelude to Axanar, a short film based on Star Trek, premiered at San Diego Comic-Con in 2014 after raising more than $100,000 from fans on Kickstarter. Creators decided to make a feature-length film called Axanar, which raised over a million dollars from fans. The filmmakers assumed that they were protected by fair use, but when Paramount sued them, the judge sided with the copyright holders. Copyright law only used to be relevant to professional artists and lawyers, said Feisler, before the internet. Why would you have to know anything about copyright law? I personally think that if you are a content creator on any platform or just a creator in general, even if it's not content, I think you should know what your legal rights are as an artist and uh, how your works can be protected. And if there's a possibility that you could be violating another artist's copyright. I just think that's something you should know to protect yourself. And it's just one of those kind of things where it's not the, it's the not fun part of this job. There's just things that you have to know to protect yourself, your content, your creations, et cetera, and make sure that you are not infringing on that of someone else. There's a very strong non-commercialization norm in many fan communities, said Rebecca Tushnet. And works have generally slid under the radar as long as they are not monetized. But once a fan creator starts making money, the copyright holder might start paying closer attention, which I don't think is that surprising. For a lot of artists, a lot of writers, a lot of uh, musicians, et cetera, a lot of their art, their creations are their babies. Like that's, that's them to some degree, you know? And so I get why you would have an issue with this. And Netflix, again, they care about money. Bridgerton isn't the first media property to inspire collaborative musical on TikTok. Stemming from a serendipitous viral moment, Ratatouille, the TikTok musical premiered as a one night charity live stream for the Actors Fund in January of 2021. For that production, the question of fair use wasn't relevant as the copyright holder Disney did not sue. Although we do not have development plans for the title, we love when our fans engage with Disney stories, Disney said in a statement to the Los Angeles Times. We applaud and thank all of the online theater makers for helping the benefit the Actors Fund in this unprecedented time of need. To be fair, with where it was in the year, if they had stepped on it, see, that was always gonna be going to charity though. I don't think the Bridgerton musical live production was there. I don't think there's a discussion of where that money is going. I think they're just like, hey, we're selling takes as this thing, you know? And so it's assumed it's going to production itself. And then Barlow and Barracks, they own, they own the unofficial Bridgerton musical at this point. If Disney themselves stepped on the live performance with tickets going to charity, 
specifically the Actors Fund, where at the time, 2021 January is when we had like December and then I think into January is where we had that other little spike of COVID. And so a lot of productions were kind of in flux or were shutting down temporarily and all this other stuff. Even in Disney's perspective, it's not in their best interest to sue in that case. It wouldn't be good. It wouldn't have gone well for them. It would have been really bad. But yeah, Netflix has nothing to lose at this point. It's already, they already got bad press. They're already canceling things left, right, and center. They're already hemorrhaging subscribers. They have nothing to lose here. Article also goes on to talk about a Harry Potter musical. They go on to say, you know, though the Harry Potter copyright holder never sues Star Kid, it, its members have stated that they reached an agreement with Warner Brothers to not charge admission to any Harry Potter related performances. So they asked Tushnet uh, if transforming the show into a musical is considered transformative enough. And uh, she said, whether it's parodic or not, you want to do something noticeably different from the original other than just translating it into a new medium. So again, this is all up to a judge to decide. From what I'm seeing, I almost don't want this to go to trial because I do think it'll be bad. Because what if they do win? Barlow and Bear. Even Feisler here says, I personally kind of hope that the case settles. If this went to court and Netflix won, I might worry a little bit about precedent setting for future fan work. See, if either group wins, this could be a problem because I think it's very clear here. And that seems to be the sentiment I'm seeing on TikTok for the most part is that people are like, they clearly thought we were gonna be on their side, Barlow and Bear, but this is a very clear cut copyright infringement, why would we be on theirs? Like they're kind of forcing us to be on Netflix's side type of thing. So I wanna talk about this in the event that Barlow and Bear do win, which I, I don't think they would, but in the event that they do, I wanna bring up a point from Brian the BA on TikTok. Great TikToks, if you wanna go check them out. You see all these books, they're all by different authors. And as of right now, all of these authors retain their copyright for derivative works, which currently includes any adaptations to other media forms, such as musicals, TV shows, movies. And if this case goes to trial and Barlow and Bear somehow manage to win, they will likely lose those rights. Say you're Julia Quinn, okay? You get your book published. You create a whole series around the Bridgerton siblings, eight siblings who go through the trials and tribulations of love and Regency England. Put out the books, they do pretty good. They, you make some money, make good money. And then a couple of years later, after you put out all your books, a show's announced, you see a trailer and it's the same names, the same characters, the same plots, the same everything, and you realize, oh my God, those are my books. And then on the final screen of the trailer says, based on the Bridgerton books by Julia Quinn, but in no way affiliated with Julia Quinn and not done with the permission of Julia Quinn. So you go to a lawyer and you say, they stole my work, I wanna sue them for copyright infringement. And then that lawyer says, well, you could, but because Barlow and Bear won their lawsuit against Netflix, they can in fact do an adaptation without the licensing from you. It's considered an unofficial adaptation and therefore is legal. That's what some people are concerned about. That's what I would be concerned about. Again, I think that as a creator, as a creative in general, whether you're a writer, a musician, a filmmaker, an artist, you want to protect your creations. And this lawsuit, if either side wins, it could be a problem, but if Barlow and Bear win, this could be detrimental. I do think that creatives should have the ability to protect their work. The same goes here. This case, again, I agree with Feisler that yeah, Netflix winning would also be an issue with future fan works. This could be an issue with say YouTubers talking about a movie and doing a transformative review or a fair use review because reviewing a work is considered fa fair use, I believe at this time. Who knows what this could change? You know, the same thing. Same goes with if Barlow and Bear win and what that could mean for people and what that could mean for artists and authors and the like. I kind of hope they settle. I mean, I at this point, if Netflix would win, I do believe. Um, also side note, it's my understanding that Netflix, in fact, offered Barlow and Bear licensing so that they could do their live performances and continue to operate as they wanted to. Barlow and Bear denied it. It is no secret that in early 2021, Netflix did not stop what Barlow and Bear represented as their personal TikTok fan tribute to Bridgerton. Numerous individuals involved in the creation of Bridgerton, including actors, producers, and Netflix applauded Barlow and Bear, including with the tweet, absolutely blown away by the Bridgerton musical playing out on TikTok, Barlow and Bear benefited from the attention. They went viral. I don't think that's part of why, but you know, whatever. In March, 2021, Barlow and Bear's council asked expressly for Netflix's blessing of a recorded album and a single specific UK charity promotion to occur in 
or around July or August of 2021, for which they would engage West End performers who had just been furloughed because of the pandemic. Netflix responded in June that it was not approving or authorizing the album's release or any charity performances, but in the spirit of supporting what Barlow and Bear represented as two Bridgerton fans, expression of their appreciation for the series, it stated that it is not standing in the way. Barlow and Bear did not ask for, and Netflix never granted, ongoing authorization or any license. Ultimately, they requested performances did not happen. In August, after learning that Barlow and Bear were due to release an album on Spotify the following month, Netflix sought to advise them of a clear line. Netflix representatives stressed to Barlow and Bear's representative that Netflix would not authorize and did not want them to engage in any live performances or other derivative works that might compete with Netflix's own planned live events. They specifically mentioned the Bridgerton experience. At the time, Barlow and Bear's representative stated no such events or other works based on the unofficial Bridgerton musical were planned. Barlow and Bear's representative stated that they planned to do this live concert focus on Barlow and Bear's broader repertoire, not the unofficial Bridgerton musical, and that it would include only a few of the songs. Netflix again reiterated that live performances of the unofficial Bridgerton musical were not authorized and the UK event should be only a one-time occurrence. Barlow and Bear's representative confirmed that they fully understood. They also promised that they did not have any additional plans for more Bridgerton-inspired works or live shows that would include songs from the unofficial Bridgerton musical. Given Netflix's clear statement to Barlow and Bear that this would be last such event, Barlow and Bear's assurances that it would be and their express statement that they plan to focus on other projects to avoid becoming known as Bridgerton Girls, Netflix did not seek to halt the scheduled charity event in the UK. Again, in March 2022, following Barlow and Bear's Grammy nomination, Netflix reached out again to reiterate the lines. Barlow and Bear's representative assured Netflix that they did not have any Bridgerton-related plans other than the Grammy nomination and any follow-up interviews that if they were to win. Barlow and Bear's representative reiterated that Netflix should not worry because Barlow and Bear did not want to be known only for their work derivative of Bridgerton, so they would be focusing on other activities in the future. Despite their prior assurances, on June 7th, 2022, Barlow and Bear's representative informed Netflix for the first time that they would be performing the unofficial Bridgerton musical at the Kennedy Center on July 26th. Netflix sought to understand from them what the type of performance would be and if it would be for charity. Rather than engaging with Netflix on its questions, Barlow and Bear's representative stated they were not asking for Netflix's permission and would not further delay the announcement of the performance to afford the parties time to discuss. They publicly announced the Kennedy Center show within days. Multiple times in June and July of 2022, Netflix informed counsel for Barlow and Bear that on July 26th performance and any subsequent live performances were not authorized and that such exploitation would constitute willful copyright and trained bar infringement unless they negotiated a license, which Netflix was willing to do. Netflix offered Barlow and Bear a license that would allow them to proceed with their scheduled live performances at the Kennedy Center and Royal Albert Hall. Continued distributing their album and perform the Bridgerton expired musical long songs live as part of a larger programs going forward. Barlow and Bear refused. I'm trying to understand where the leap happened. I'm assuming something else is happening that's not being included in this complaint. And maybe we'll hear about it from the Barlow and Bear side of things once their counsel actually formally responds, because it's like, okay, we're only doing charity. We're only doing charity. Surprise. We're doing this show and we're not answering any of your questions and we don't need your license anymore. I'm assuming that they, did the charity shows ended up happening? I always love when I start Googling for these things and I find like like local papers for wherever the person is from being like, let's talk about this. <laughs> I don't know if the Bridgerton musical charity performance in the West End actually happened. I can't seem to find proof of that. I'm assuming it did. It would make sense if it did happen because they're like, okay, well they let us do this. So why can't they do this? You know, that would make sense to me. The complaint goes on to talk about irreparable harm to the Netflix Bridgerton brand because of of this. So here are the different counts for this lawsuit. Count one, copyright infringement. Count two is declaratory relief. Uh, basically, Barlow and Bear put that they had been allowed or been given permission of some sort to put on the musical when they in fact had not been reached any sort of agreement with Netflix. Count three, infringement of registered trademarks under 15 USC squiggly 1114. Someone's gonna make fun of me for that. They use like the logo trademark Bridgerton and all of that. Count four, Four, uh, false designation of origin under 15 USC. Again, same thing. I think it's the actual trademark. Do I think this is gonna go to trial? I kind of hope not. Honestly, I don't think that Barlow and Bear would win 
on the other three counts. Like using your trademarked logo, logo, that's pretty cut and dry. That's pretty clear. That I believe is what Archive of Our Own got, Pocket Archive of Our Own on, uh, was the color red specifically as it was trademarked by them, that and then also their logo. That's pretty cut and dry. The only thing they could potentially try and argue is the fair use copyright infringement potentially. I don't think they'll win. Cause again, we saw everything documented on social media as they were writing it. I don't think they'll win. I hope they don't at this point, frankly. Um, you're, you're making me side with Netflix. That, it seems like they gave you every opportunity to listen and you just chose not to. And then they offered you licensing and you said no. Like, I, I'm sorry, I'm on Netflix's side and I don't wanna do that. I, I don't want to, I'm usually not. But still, the end. Okay, we're done. Anyways, that's gonna be it. Um, have you heard any of the Bridgerton musical? Did you go to the Kennedy Center performance? Do you think they're actually gonna go through with the Albert Hall performance? Because my understanding right now, they are still selling those tickets and they have not canceled that. Do you think that Netflix is in the right or do you think Barlow and Vera are in the right? Let me know, comment down below. Reminder of a podcast, the Swell Shenanigans podcast. I'm no longer doing weekly episodes, but I currently have over 46 episodes available and I will be adding more in the future. Reminder, I have merch like that mug back there. Shout out to all my patrons. Thank you so much for supporting my own Patreon. If you'd also explore my own Patreon, love this down below. If you'd like to follow me on my social media, that'll be all up here. And that's gonna be it. Have a lovely day. Goodbye. And they offered you the licensing. They offered it to you. Obviously we don't know the amount, but an offer was made. You were given the potential opportunity to be able to make, do live shows as many as you want free and clear. And you said no. No, I'm not on your side. Thank you, Alan, Cameron, Christopher, Chris, Crash PC, China, Devion, David, Dirty One, Don, Elliot, Evan, Eric, Hopeless, Incognito, Jekka Ray, Joe, John M, Jordan, Joseph, Kenny, Kim, Kristen, Lamb, Lex, Lisa, Louise, Matt, Matt, O, Matthew, S, me, Michael, Michael, J, Micah, Nathan, Nathaniel, Pat, Penn, Richard, Rob, Red, Robert, Ross, Sam, Serena, Skylar, Simon, Tasha, Tim, Tom, Wendy, Williams, Andrews, Wayne.